You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check out my Patreon. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. All links are in the description. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. All that good junk. Uh, glad to see you guys here. This is my first stream in... Well, aside from yesterday, I streamed yesterday on my uh, my Fireside Chat channel. My first stream, aside from that, in like know, two weeks or something like that. It's crazy. Anyway, welcome back. Today, I want to talk about John Hagee. I have this guy on screen here, John Hagee. He's a televangelist, and he has been in the industry since like forever. He is like Kenneth Copeland, a mainstay within evangelicalism, right? Or within televangelism. Uh, hang on, let me just... I feel like I'm not quite centered. Still not quite centered. Anyway, he's a mainstay, and he said some absolutely wild stuff. Um, let me just find a really good one. Let's see here. I've got... Uh... Okay, yeah, here we go, here. Here, this is a pretty good one. Um, hang on. Let me just shoot. Okay, let's try this. This is from 2014. If you guys weren't, like, paying attention to politics in 2014, Ebola was a thing. Everybody was all freaked out that Ebola was going to happen. It was mostly Fox News that was spreading it. And uh, nobody else cared or was paying any attention because they, they recognized that it was a terrible thing that was happening to innocent people in uh on the country of africa but i'm sorry on the continent of africa <laughs> my mistake that was happening to innocent people on the continent of africa but it wasn't happening here in america and people like john hagee were convinced it was coming to america and when it did it was going to destroy the country basically this is mid uh mid-october 20 or 2014 yeah mid-october 2014 Oh, sorry, let me change my outputs. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. I want every American to hear this very clearly. I'm with it. Go ahead. The prophet Joel says in the third chapter, I, God, will bring all nations. And hear that phrase. By the way, that's his son on the left. I don't know if you guys knew. I think he's taking a bigger role in the system or like he's he's taking over for Hagee sometime soon or something i'm not sure and hear that phrase all nations includes america into judgment for they have divided up my land the land of israel god says when any nation divides up the land of israel they are subject to judgment and he thinks America did that, I guess. And dividing Jerusalem is dividing the land. Our president is is dead set on dividing Jerusalem. He's talking about Obama. No, he wasn't. What is this guy smoking? My God. God is watching, and he will bring America into judgment. There are grounds to say judgment has already begun. No, there aren't. What does he mean by there are grounds? There are not grounds to claim that. Because he, the president, has been fighting to divide Jerusalem for years now. We are. I mean, this is completely made up. Obama did not hate Israel. What is he talking about? We are now experiencing the crisis of Ebola. We have a crisis in our economy. Who's we? We are... Suffering Ebola? No, nobody in America. I think there were two cases in the U.S. or something. Nobody caught Ebola here. Okay, it wasn't happening. This guy, of course, fed right into the fear mongering and furthered the fear intentionally. We are worried on every hand that we're going to be attacked by radical Islam. Again, who is we? Who was worried about this in 2014? And there are some very rational voices saying that's their ne we are their next target. And w who are these rational voices? I mean, you're seeing all the problems here, right? That's John Hagee. He said some wild stuff before, some wild stuff. Well, I've been writing this book 
about Jehovah's Witnesses and their prophecy and beliefs and all that other junk. And I came across this prophecy from Jehovah's Witnesses called the King of the North Prophecy, okay? Now, the King of the North Prophecy is real windy and complex, but I got, I got my head around it. I figured it out. I know what they believe about it. I know how they got there and why they believe what they do and everything else. So I start just kind of Googling around King of the North, King of the South, see who else is talking about it. Lo and behold, our buddy John Hagee is talking about the King of the North and the King of the South. He has a video titled, what is this? The King of the North. And it, it just released very recently, actually. So uh, I want to talk about John Hagee and his conceptualization, I guess you could say, of the King of the North, King of the South. Jehovah's Witnesses, for the record, have named who they believe the King of the North and the King of the South are. Um, just a little bit of background on the on the you know the prophecy before we watch the video. Um, while we watch, we're gonna play some Breath of the Wild too, just kind of going around doing whatever. It'll be in the background. It won't bother you too much if you've never seen it. But a little bit of background on it. Um, the book of Daniel is full of all kinds of stuff, like all kinds of apocalyptic visions and weird stuff, right? And apocalypticism was a genre of writing all the way back in, you know, Daniel's days. In fact, Daniel is when apocalyptic writing as a genre became as, you know, it came into its prime. It was defined by the time it hit the book of Daniel, basically. So the book of Daniel has apocalypticism as writing, and the formula for the writing style goes like this. The writer gets this bizarre, inexplicable vision that makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know, seeing people with, like, swords made of fire and gigantic beasts that climb out of the sea that have, like, 15 heads and blah, 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 whatever. Nobody understands what the hell is going on, the reader or the writer. And conveniently, an angel always appears to explain to the writer what he has just seen. And uh, I've seen a common trope within this apocalyptic writing style is the writer has a tendency to... Uh, wait, I lost my train of thought with that one. Um, a common trope for it is... Oh, the, the writer is trying to figure something out that's going to happen in the future. So a lot of the time, apocalyptic genre writing will be set in a different time frame than it was actually written, right? So the book of Daniel was set in the year, I don't know, between 500 and 600 BCE, right? 400 er years earlier than it was actually written. It was actually written in the year 164 BCE, which is immediately after the Maccabean revolt, the the revolt that that inspired the story of Hanukkah, basically. You know, the Maccabees fought uh, the Greek um, kingdom or, the, you know, the Greek people, the people who were trying to Hellenize, turn them into Greek speakers and cultural, turn their culture more to Greek. Um, well, the Maccabees were like mercenaries who came in and said, go heck yourself, and then killed everything and everybody who wanted to Greekify or Hellenize. Anyways, after they won and took back the temple in Jerusalem, they operated it there as their own autonomous entity for, I don't know, 70 years or something. But immediately after the battle took place, they went into the temple to celebrate Notice that they only had, like, a day worth of oil to burn, but they needed eight days, and God extended it to eight days. Anyway, that's the story of Hanukkah. So that's the book of Daniel. It was written around that time. 164 BCE is when it was written, and it follows that exact formula as every other type of apocalyptic writing follows. And by the way, apocalyptic writing is not just in the Bible or the Old Testament or whatever. There's stuff that was written that, for example, never even made it into the Bible. 
I think there's the Apocalypse of Abraham is one of them. Could be wrong. Don't quote me. There's definitely the Apocalypse of Peter. That one didn't make it into the Bible at all. So anyways, that's apocalyptic writing. And the style it follows is absolutely bizarre vision. The reader and the writer are befuddled. An angel or a messenger steps in to explain what he's seen. And as he explains what he saw, he gives a prophecy of what's going to happen. Now, it's usually, in my opinion, what I've seen, it's set in a different time than it was actually written. And they, when they prophesy, they're, they're telling you what's going to happen all the way up to that moment. In the book of Daniel, they described, like, I don't know, five empires or something that would come and go between then and now. And the five empires just so happened to be the exact five empires that came and went between when Daniel claimed to have been written and when it was actually written. Um, so it was set in, I think, 550 BCE, which is immediately after the Jews were exiled from Jerusalem and sent to Babylon to, you know be separated from their homeland as punishment for blah, blah, blah. Um, it was written du during the exile. So the first empire that this angel talks about in, in most of the apocalypses in Daniel, first empire is Babylon. Then he says Persia will come in and take control. That happened with King Cyrus. And then he says... Greek will come, or Greece will come in and take control. Sure enough, that happened. And then he says, another empire will come in, and it will be an evil empire that will speak vulgarities against God's people and blah, blah, blah. That was the empire they were in in that moment. The Seleucid Empire run by Antiochus. I know I'm dropping a lot of information on you, but it's relevant to the conversation. So, Anyways, uh, Daniel was written during the reign of Antiochus the fourth, Epiphanes, and the guy was a, an absolute monster. He was good to Greek people, to uh, to the people in the Seleucid Empire. He was monstrously evil to the Jewish people, made them burn pig on their altar in the temple. He made them erect an altar to Zeus in the temple. Uh, he banned circumcision. Um, at, at whatever he could do, basically, to hurt the Jewish people just for the sake of it, he would do it. That's when the Maccabees stepped in and they took control and they said, you're not doing this anymore. We're done. So anyways, uh, that's when Daniel was written, actually. And at the end of the book of Daniel, in chapter 11, I think there are 12 chapters in the canonical um, Protestant Bible. The Catholic Bible has two extras maybe i don't remember anyways the protestant bible has 12 chapters in the 11th chapter it's immediately after the story or it's after not immediately after but it is after the story about the beast with um horns where one comes off and another joins and speaks vulgarities against people and blah 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 that was antiochus epiphanes that it was talking about the the horn the little horn that, that talks shit about God's people, that was Antiochus. Um, additionally, the story about... Uh, what was the other one? I'm trying to remember. There was another apocalyptic vision he had about Antiochus. Oh, shoot. I just talked about this in the book, too. I'm trying to remember. Well, anyway, um, in chapter 11, it talks about how the, the king will come from the north and the king of the north hates God's people. And the king of the south doesn't really like God's people either, but he's going to challenge the king of the north. And that's a good thing for God's people. And then they'll annihilate each other and God's people will be free to blah, 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 blah. Right. At the time, the king of the north was the kingdom literally to the north of Jerusalem, where this was probably being written or where the writer at least was from. Jerusalem, which was the Seleucid Empire. Antiochus Epiphanes IV was the king. And they were talking about the, the Sixth Syrian War. There were six, six Syrian wars, 
throughout the course of the previous like 100 years or something like that or 200 maybe so the king of the north is antiochus epiphanes the fourth the king of the south was the Ptolemy empire another offshoot of the greek empire so when alexander the great conquered greece in 330 or conquered the world in greeks name greece's name in 334 bce eventually died i don't remember when he died was that 323 or something when he died his four generals split the land for themselves they shared it basically and um you know it, it just it didn't hold together and it was a complete mess uh one of the kingdoms that came out of the greek empire after alexander died was the seleucid empire that's the one that controlled jerusalem another uh empire that came out of alexander's death was the Ptolemy empire and then we've got wait a minute the macedonians that was another and um wait a minute trying to remember right off the top of my head i went through all of these well anyways the important ones are the king of the north and south the Ptolemy um empire to the south in egypt and the seleucid empire with antiochus to the north though that's who the king of the north and the south were whoever wrote daniel 11 it wasn't daniel by the way it wasn't a real person whoever wrote it was talking about Ptolemy and Antiochus of the Seleucid Empire fighting it out. At the time, during the Sixth Syrian War, which, by the way, happened within like five years of this book being written, the uh, Sixth Syrian War did. Uh, at the time, Antiochus Epiphanes IV sent an emissary to Rome, which was not an empire yet, be an empire in another hundred years or so. Uh, or 150 years, give or take. He sent an emissary, and he asked for Rome's help fighting the Ptolemy Empire. And Rome, uh, funny enough, the Ptolemy Empire sent a an emissary to Rome also to ask for their help. Rome very well could have tipped either side if they had picked a side, but they were still recovering from their conflict with the Macedonian Empire. They were in you know, in war, they were f dealing with a war between themselves and the Macedonians. So they didn't end up helping either side. Um, I don't, I'm not actually sure who ended up winning. I don't remember. But anyways, yeah, that's what the, the whole, you know, King of the North, King of the South is. Now you have that context necessary to understand what this guy's talking about. Now with Jehovah's Witnesses and with this guy, they come in and they claim, you know what, I just remembered that other prophecy that mentions or that references Antiochus. There's a prophecy about um, Nebuchadnezzar. He has a big statue, head of gold, arms of silver, uh, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and then feet of iron and clay. That, those are my, the levels on my Patreon because of Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyways, that prophecy about, or that apocalyptic vision about seeing like this, um, you know, th this big statue, it was talking about the empires. Again, Nebuchadnezzar was the head. The arms were the Persians. The waist of bronze was the Greek empire. The legs were the Seleucid Empire that ruled uh, the the uh, J ruled Jerusalem at that immediate moment, and then the le the feet of iron and clay are unnamed. They don't name them in the Book of Daniel. You know why? Because the empire didn't exist yet. It wouldn't exist for another hundred and fifty years. It was Rome, but the fact that it isn't named in the statue apocalyptic vision the fact that it isn't named who crushes the little horn which was antiochus the fact that it wasn't named who destroys you know the king of the north or whatever specifically means that there's an open door for apocalyptic 
preachers like Jehovah's Witnesses and, um, you know, John Hagee to come in and say, I know exactly who it is. God told me who it is. It was Rome. That's who it was. But Jehovah's Witnesses have this picture that they like to parade around. It's, um, oh, let me show you the picture. Hold on. I got the picture. It's right here. I know I said we we're going to talk about John Hagee. I haven't gotten there yet. We'll get there. Okay, here's the picture right here. Let me blow this puppy up for you. Actually, let me switch sides. Flip over to the... Yeah, there we are. Okay. This is the statue of Nebuchadnezzar that he had a dream about. The dream was described... And it's an apocalyptic vision, again, in the book of Daniel. So the head was Babylon... That's correct. This is, a, this is Jehovah's Witness literature that they, they gave to us here. Uh, the arms are silver. That's Medo-Persia. It's, it's the Persian Empire, King Cyrus. That's correct. Uh, the waste of bronze was Greece. Yes, absolutely. The legs of iron were Rome. Why would they put Rome there? Rome didn't even exist when this was written. Rome had nothing to do with anything at all. And then our feet of iron and clay. Anglo-American Empire. What? Where is any of this coming from? I don't understand. I'm just lost. So anyways, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's the whole... Sorry. There we go. That's the whole King of the North, King of the South thing, if you were wondering... Um, it's just like there's a little tiny opening where people see that there was an unnamed empire at the end because Daniel was written before the empire came along. He knew some other empire is going to come along and destroy their enemies because they'd been conquered like 16 times up to that point. It was bound to happen eventually, right? He just didn't know who it was, so he didn't name them. But Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, apparently uh, John Hagee also claim to know as you know god's mouthpiece on earth they hold the uh, is the last empire listed and then the end will come only named to be russia by jehovah's witnesses not too long ago and the reason that they named russia the king of the north is because the king of the north is evil and supposed to come up against god's people right as the seleucid empire did but uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were banned from Russia back in 2017, I think. And they're, they've faced some pretty stiff persecution there as a result. So they named the King of the North officially Russia. And they named the King of the South, who is not necessarily a friend of God, but is battling you know, his enemy, the King of the North. So there's that. They named the Anglo-American Empire, which means British and U.S. forces combined. That's what that means. So in Jehovah's Witnesses' eyes, King of the North is Russia. King of the South is the United States. Now, we're going to listen to John Hagee with that preamble out of the way. We're going to listen to him describe the King of the North and the King of the South and see what he gets right, see what he gets wrong. I know the book of Daniel like the back of my hand at this point, seriously. Like, you guys don't even know how much research and study I, I've done on this subject in the past 11 days. I wrote 100, basically 111 words in 11 days. That's crazy. All right, let's listen to this goober over here tell us about his ideas. are these kings? The king of the north is Russia. I'll prove that in just a moment. I was surprised to hear him point that he believes that it's Russia too. That actually blew me away. Okay. The king of the south is the Arab Islamic forces. Yeah, again, Jehovah's Witnesses think that the king of the south is America, not Islamic forces. Where did he get any of this? Again, the prophecy, it wasn't even a prophecy. It was Daniel, the book of Daniel, not the writer, because the guy was not a real person. He's not a historical figure. Whoever wrote the book of Daniel, he was talking about his modern day, like what was happening in that moment. He was not 
making any claims about what would happen in the future, 2,000 years or whatever. He was saying, one day, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes will be destroyed by the king of the south, since he's the king of the north. That's what he's saying. Where did he come up with all this nonsense about Russia being the north and the Islamic, Islamic nations being the south? Gets even crazier. Just keep listening. Prove that in just a moment. The king of the south is the Arab Islamic forces. The king of the west is America. And there is no king of the west. The story has a king of the north and south. Where are you getting the king of the west from anyway? And the United Kingdom that will be led by the Antichrist, who will force every person on the earth to receive his mark in his right hand or their forehead. Those dude doesn't under God, dude. I I also did a lot of research into the book of Revelation, and I know that book like the back of my hand, too. I actually understand what was being discussed in the book of Revelation, and this guy is mutilating it terribly. But OK, you know what? I'm going to let him keep going. We're not going to nitpick. Let's keep going on the earth to receive his mark in his right hand or their forehead it's just so stupid that's all i'm saying it's so stupid i'm sorry those who do not will be decapitated there is the king of the east which is china a military superpower who neither fears nor respects the united states of america there are four kings playing this final game of thrones what where did he get four kings from why does he think that there are four kings doing anything at all i don't understand where did he get any of these numbers any of this information none of this is in the bible i know where he got the king of the north and the south from where are the king of the east and west from where is any of this from at all this is complete fabricated nonsense entirely all right i'm getting hung up on the detail let's keep going here they want to sit on that throne they want to dominate and control you and without jesus christ in your life they will do it who is this gog around whom history's climatic events will occur oh he's saying he's talking about gog and magog now um gog oh god this is another ridiculous prophecy that people have read into that isn't even a prophecy Gog, G-O-G, and Magog, M-A-G-O-G, were two other things mentioned in the Bible, a total of twice. I think once in the book of Ezekiel and once in the book of Genesis, I believe. And there is very little context about either of them, but the assumption is that Magog was likely property, physical property, and Gog was a person of sorts. I don't want to speak on it, but if he gets into it more, uh, we'll look into it more and just see if we can figure it out. Because it's been a while since I've studied Gog and Magog. Matter of fact, you know, I, I have finished writing my book, but I should probably add a section about Gog and Magog. I'm going to write that down before I forget. Who is he? Ezekiel 38.2. Son of man, there set your face against Gog. There you go. I knew it was in Ezekiel. Yeah. Ezekiel and Genesis, I think. Gog is a man. Today, that man is Vladimir Putin. May oh, Putin is supposedly Gog. Okay, interesting. Both Gog and the king of the north, apparently. All right. Gog is the land of Russia, the king of the north. Obviously, the name Russia does not appear in Scripture, but the geographic location given in the Bible is pinpoint accuracy. Let's connect the dots in prophetic Scripture. When you go to Genesis 10 and 2, Magog is referred to as one of the sons of Japheth, whom ethnologists tell us that his descendants after the flood of Noah migrated from Asia Minor to the north beyond the Caspian and Black Sea. The land beyond the Caspian and Black Sea is Russia. Listen to this Bible and history. I mean, not for nothing, but there's a lot of land beyond the Caspian and Black Sea. It's not just Russia, but okay. Historical fact, Gog is a descendant of Esau. He says, listen to this historical fact. Gog is, an, is a descendant of Esau. Well, Gog is not real. It's not a historical fact character and the bible only says anything at all about gog a total of twice and what it does say about gog 
is sparse at best. So, like, I don't know how he's come to the conclusions that he's come to here. This is, like, well beyond reaching. This isn't even reaching anywhere. This is just fabricating nonsense. Jacob and Esau had a very bitter relationship. The bitterness of that relationship has spread from generation to generation. The crisis in the Middle East right now is a family feud that was never really settled. Look, I don't, I don't know who needs to hear this or who knows this or whatever, but Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, Moses, they were fake. They were not real Bible characters. They were pretend. Okay? They were used to make a point. That's it. They were used to make a point about, I guess, history or whatever. Or they were trying, you know, it was part of origin literature. It was an origin story. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, Muslims have similar ideas, but not exactly the same about Jacob and Isaac and all that. There's another kid in there named Ishmael. Muslims, I believe Ishmael was supposed to be Abraham's son, one of Abraham's sons. Not, wait, it was, Abraham's son was Isaac. Isaac's sons were Jacob and Esau. Is that right? I don't remember if I got that family tree correct. Anyways, that's the Jewish conceptualization of it. But I believe that Jacob's brother in, like, in Muslims' beliefs is actually... Ishmael instead and he he was he received the blessing he was the one that was going to be sacrificed and he was like the special thing that's like the patriarch of everything in Islam um, so they're only an Abrahamic religion in technicality because they're so far removed from like the Abrahamic line but anyway yeah they're all fake they're all fake characters none of it was real it, it all exists as allegory Haman is a descendant of Esau. Haman planned the first Holocaust. In okay, I don't know who Haman is. I don't remember from the Bible. I'd have to look that up. And to say that somebody planned the first Holocaust is just... I'm sorry, man. This is psychotic. By the way, this is the same guy who had uh, John... I'm sorry, what John McCain... Um, basically declined to accept this guy's... Uh, endorsement because he said that he believes that Hitler was sent here by God to force Jews back to Israel so that they can, you know, reconstruct the third temple and blah, 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 whatever. The third temple bring back, bring by an age of prosperity for Christians and Jews will die horribly because that's part of Christian belief, so on and so forth. Um, so anyways, when he said that stuff, basically... John McCain in, in 08 was like, I'm out. No, thank you. Take your endorsement and cram it up your ass, basically. In the land of Persia, which is modern... Sorry, let's step back. Listen again. Settled. Haman is a descendant of Esau. Haman planned the first Holocaust in the land of Persia, which is modern-day Iran. The plot... That's correct, yep. Persia was modern-day Iran, how it's actually pronounced. Ishmael is a was Abraham's first son. Okay, okay. I, I knew that there was a connection there. I just did not remember what it was. Ishmael was Abraham's first son. Isaac was his second son. Is that right? And Isaac was the sacrifice in Jewish lore. Um, but in um, uh, Muslim lore, the sacrifice was supposed to be Ishmael. It's so interesting that they have, like, the same stories, but completely different characters and events and outcomes. Anyway. Haman was the vizier in Esther who tried to kill Jews. Oh! Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, I remember that. What did I just get? Oh, noble. I remember now. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. In the land of Persia, which is modern-day Iran... The plot was discovered and destroyed by Queen Esther. Histor there you go. Um, we got uh, Coop Master over here 
taking W after W with these history stories. Historians recognize Hitler's grandfather was Jewish. Hitler. No, no, no. Hitler's grandfather was not Jewish. Okay. I don't like the guy any more than anybody else, but we got to be factual about him. I'm sorry. That's just what it is. The claim that Hitler's grandfather was Jewish was propaganda that was spread around by Hitler's political opponents from the era when he was running for office and stuff. His political opponents made a bunch of claims because he, did, uh, you know, renowned for not liking Jews. So they claimed that he was of Jewish descent. It's just not true. There's at the very least, there's no way to, to prove that. Uh, the records just did not exist. There is no hard evidence of that. It's just made up. But when has a completely fabricated story ever gotten in the way of old um, Pastor John Hagee over here, right? The plot was discovered and destroyed by Queen Esther. Historians recognize Hitler's grandfather was Jewish. Hitler no. Hitler is a descendant of Esau. No. Jewish scholars state that all the four kings are descendants of Esau. Remember that their objective is to destroy the land of Israel and the Jewish people. Okay, I'm going to say no because that sounds like nonsense, but I don't actually have any idea what the hell he's talking about. The four kings? I guess the king of the north, south, east, and west? I mean, there is no king of the east and west as far as I can remember. Am I missing something? Did I forget a Bible verse? Certainly not from the book of Daniel. There's no king of the east or west, right? I don't remember any of this. This sounds completely made up to me. God said, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. That is a powerful statement. That's recorded in Romans, the ninth chapter and the 13th verse. Why? Dude, I love how in the Bible... Jacob was such a colossal scumbag, right? Like, he didn't do anything to further the goals or interests of anybody. Didn't give a shit about his parents or his family or his anything at all. Esau is out there working his nuts off for the family and deserves to, by all accounts, inherit what is coming to him. And this jerk-off over here, Jacob rolls in, dresses up like Esau with furry hands and stuff because Esau was super hairy, apparently, and deepens his voice and says, oh, yes, I'm Esau. Um, please give me all of your stuff, father, before you die. And sure enough, he fell for it because he couldn't see very well. What a scumbag move, right? Oh, my God. What is wrong with this guy? So anyways, that's the guy that became Israel. He also wrestled an angel to the ground, allegedly, and forced a blessing out of him. And the angel blessed him by telling him that he, he would be like the father of Israel. His name is now Israel, and he's going to birth like all these kids that are going to whatever. Like, seriously, when you think about it, Jacob was a complete scumbag. Because God looked through the telescope of time and he saw the river of blood that the descendants of Esau would cause the Jewish people to shed. And he said, I hate that man. The bitterness between Jacob and Esau has lasted for thousands of years. Think about it. Follow this. Gog is the man as the ruler of Magog, the land which is Russia is described by Ezekiel as the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. There th okay, he's just dropping name after name and idea after idea, not connecting any of them with Bible verse. He hasn't even told us who the king of the north, south, east, or west are or where they came from. Where did he get those Bible verses from? Do you just pull that straight out of his ass? Is that where all that came from? This is straight up bizarre told you about poor uh, poor Eam last night oh yeah i remember yeah yeah i think i remember you mentioning yeah the whole family sucked absolutely the whole family was terrible um as described in the bible of course i don't we have no reason to believe that any of them were real um but anyways yeah
The three things here, a prince and two cities, Meshech and Tubal. The expression chief prince is translated in the NASB Bible as the prince of Rosh. Wait, why is he using the NASV Bible? This is something that when I was writing this book here, I had to like resist at all costs. You know what I did? I decided to use one translation and one translation only throughout the entirety of the book that I wrote. The only time I used another translation was when I used the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witnesses Translation, in an effort to compare the changes that they made to the original text. That's it. The translation I used was the NRSV, which is the preferred translation by scholars. It seems to be the most accurate, and it was not translated by evangelicals the way that, say, the NIV was. They translated out errors that they believed existed, and they translated in their already existing beliefs. So, anyways, the NRSV doesn't do that. And uh, so I used that translation all the way through. Something I've noticed with televangelists is they'll do this. They'll do this exact thing. They will pick and choose which translations that they want to use at any given moment, whichever one is convenient. The amp, the like the amplified version, that happens to be pretty convenient from time to time. King James version's kind of convenient sometimes. And now I guess we've got this one, whichever one it was. Translated in the NASB Bible. The NASV, never heard of it. Why is he using the NASV? Does he use this one regularly? It's either accurate or it's not. You can't pick one that favors your position better. As the prince of Rosh. Rosh is the root word for the modern word Russia. Gog is also related to Meshech and Tubal, which is a variation of the spelling of Moscow and Tobolsk, an area in the rural section of Russia. Okay, I don't know about any of that. I suppose it's possible. Maybe I'm just unfamiliar, have not looked into this heavily enough. I think that the Bible was referring to Russia at a couple of different spots, or the area of Russia at a couple spots pretty early on. Um, the, the area, like, past the Caucasus Mountains and stuff. But to think that, like, the Bible is referring to modern-day Russia in its prophecies, its modern-day prophecies about what's happening in the world right now, that is absurd on so many levels. I don't even know what to do with it. Therefore, the king of the north is Russia, and the chief prince today is Vladimir Putin. He is trying to rebuild the Russian Empire. Vladimir Putin, nice, okay. So is he supposed to be good or bad? I guess he's supposed to be bad in Hagee's eyes, right? Because isn't the King of the North portrayed as evil in the Old Testament? I believe he is. And I mean, that's unusual because typically... Christians, well, oh, let me rephrase, evangelical extremists, like Trump extremists, are absolutely in love with Putin. They love him to death. They do anything for the guy. It's weird at this point. So it's unusual to me to hear somebody talking about Vladimir Putin in a negative way when that person is like a televangelist. Huh, interesting. It, he thinks he can conquer the world. Who are Russia's allies that will follow Russia in the invasion of Israel? Ezekiel 38, 5 and 6 list the five major armies in this massive invasion. Persia, which is Iran, planned the first Holocaust under Haman. Ha Iran, it's pronounced Iran. And also, I mean, I, I think the only accurate thing that this dude has said so far is that Persia was part of Iran, yes. P Persia was from Iran originally, and eventually it took over the area of Jerusalem, of um, Judah or Judea, and uh, under Persia, like it, ca it captured the Babylonian Empire, 
which was really, really bad to the Jews. The Babylonian Empire was. But when it captured the when Cyrus from Persia came in and captured the Babylonian Empire. Um, things were not quite as bad for the Jews. Things started to look up a little bit for them. They were freed from their captivity and there was a slow trickle back to Jerusalem from um, like from Babylon, historical Babylon after being freed. And um, yeah, Persia was originally in that area, Iran. And Babylon is from modern day Iraq. Uh, but Persia did take over the entire area. They took over everything. They were the next large empire. So, yeah. He keeps saying Iran, but, like, they covered, like, Turkey and Egypt and all of it. They had the entire Fertile Crescent, everything, everywhere. The whole Levant. Haman hung on the gallows that he built for the Jewish people. There is a Bible principle that exactly what you do to the Jewish people, God will do to you. Haman built a gallows to hang the Jewish people on, and he and his sons hung on that gallows. It goes like this. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. It was true then. It's true today. It will be true forever. God. You know, I, I find it fascinating that he's saying that if you upset the Jewish people, if you hurt Jews, if you do something against Jews, then you will suffer because the Jews are God's chosen people or whatever, right? I'm I'm super fascinated by his, like, viewpoint on this because Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, they claimed that... Oh, shoot, my battery's saying They claimed that Jews are not God's chosen people anymore ever since Jesus came it was opened up to Gentiles and Jews were just cut out of the equation now. So all of the old prophecies that existed for Jews transfer over to Christians. That's Jehovah's Witnesses viewpoint. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's like the prophecies or whatever, the apocalyptic writing that existed all the way back then was intended for people of that time, was intended for the Jews of that era. Period. You can't claim it for yourself or claim that there's like a new interpretation that you've come across that applies to you instead of them. It's just like, what are you talking about, man? Really? God says so, and his word is eternally true. Give the Lord praise in the house. God said so, and his, his word is eternally true. That's what he just said. Listen again. Well, bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. It was true then, it's true today, it will be true forever. God says so, and his word is eternally true. Give the Lord praise in the house. It's fascinating to me that he just fabricated this Bible principle out of absolutely nothing, right? So he says, if somebody does something negative against a Jewish person that person will suffer terribly. Even though in his mind, God's people are not Jewish anymore. In his theology, God's people are Christians, right? Why is he talking about hurting Jewish people and you'll be hurt ten tenfold or whatever by God for hurting Jewish people? And so he comes up with this bizarre theology, makes no sense at all, and then he claims that it's in the Bible with no basis and says, because it's in the Bible, it is eternal and final and unquestionable, uh, unquestionable. So he just created a fake, um, what do you call it? Like a fake doctrine, a fabricated doctrine that is nowhere to be found in the Bible. And then claims that if you contradict him, you are contradicting God himself. That's what he just did. Just insane, man. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing, by the way. They claim ultimate authority, unquestioning authority. Any criticism of Jehovah's Witnesses is a criticism of God himself and unacceptable. Ethiopia. Those are the Islamic Arab Spring nations driven 
by the demonic spirit of anti-Semitism. Libya, Gomer and his bands, Ezekiel 38, 6. Ezekiel had a whole bunch of apocalyptic writing in it, just like Daniel and Isaiah, and the book of Revelation was really bad. It was like, the book of Revelation was just one big apocalyptic text. It was a problem. Uh, but anyways, yeah, uh, Ezekiel had a lot of it, and it led to the strangest interpretations. Oh my God, dude. I'm really disappointed. I haven't heard back from that professor, by the by. I've been waiting to hear from, from this professor about a prophecy I was reading in Daniel. I needed him to tie it together for me, and I still haven't heard from the guy. Keep thinking maybe it's because he's on vacation or something, but, like, come on. How long are research professors on vacation? You know? Biblical scholar Raphael Eisenberg states, quote, Gomer and all his bands are the Germans, followed by the French and the British. Also coming with Russia, Togarma. Was oh my God, they're naming people right now. So uh, I guess in the, I don't know what Bible verse he's even talking about right now. He didn't name one, did he? Apparently there's a Bible verse in this guy's mind that lists a whole bunch of things that are going to happen. A bunch of um, countries or prophecies that are going to be fulfilled and these countries are going to be empires, that blah, 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 whatever. But he doesn't tell us a Bible verse. He simply decides to start naming important, like, locations and events without actually giving us any way to verify anything he said. But you know what? You're supposed to believe it anyways. You know why? Because he speaks for God, of course. French and the British, also coming with Russia, Togarma, was the son of Gomer. According to Josephus, this is Turkey and nine more minor nations that will join Turkey. What unites them all? The spirit of anti-Semitism, the hatred for God's chosen people. Why? Because God used the Jewish people to write this book. Every That's so interesting. I thought, like, this is, Jehovah's Witnesses have completely changed the narrative. They don't say, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. The Jewish people wrote the Bible. They don't say that. They say God's people wrote the Bible, and God's people have changed over the years. They used to be Jews, and now they are Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the way they view it. And I find it so fascinating that this guy still seems to be of the mind, of the belief, that God's people are still to this day Jews. That is really interesting to me. Everything in this Bible that liberates us from the power of sin was written by the anointed hand of a Jewish writer. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was a Jewish rabbi. He's coming back as a Jewish rabbi. He That's fair enough. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, and um, you may not want to hear this, but to be perfectly frank, Christianity as conceptualized by Jesus himself, was intended to be for Jews. It wasn't opened up to Gentiles until after Jesus died, way after he died. Paul decided to come along and say, yeah, let's invite Gentiles in. He's coming back wearing a prayer shawl. Like, did anybody in this talk understand anything that he just said? Anybody in this room that we're looking at right now, did they understand a lick of that? I mean, I have an obscene amount of knowledge now on the book of Daniel and the prophecies contained and who the king of the north and south are and all kinds of other apocalyptic stuff. I know so much about apocalypticism now. It's ridiculous. And I was following that for the most part, largely, but not entirely. You can't convince me that anybody in this room had any clue what he's even talking about. The majority of the fighting force invading Israel will be Ishmael's descendants. Ishmael, that's a reference to... Um, Muslims, because Muslims believe that Ishmael was like the father of their 
whole tribe or whatever, if you will, much like Jacob or Israel was the tribe of the Jews or the, the father of the Jews or whatever. Ishmael, remember, is the son of Abraham with Hagar. Hagar and Ishmael were cast out and the bitter resentment has lasted for thousands of years. God says to Russia in Ezekiel 38, 7, be a guard unto them. Say that with me. Be a guard unto them. The better translation is you, Russia, will be a commander unto them. You will lead these five vicious anti-Semitic armies to crush the chosen people, and my fury is going to come up in my face. Let me tell you something. The only thing that matches the love of God is the wrath of God. So the only thing that matches the love of God is the pure, unadulterated, vile hate that he has. So he knows how to hate people just as well or even better than how he knows how to love people. Great. So glad to hear that. Fantastic news. Thank you. The only thing that matches the beauty of heaven is the horror of hell. Don't oh, the wait. Uh, so Coopmaster... Um, Jewish guy in my chat says the brothers made up when Abraham died. So Ishmael started getting along with, um, with Jacob. Wait, was it, was it Ishmael? I, I don't remember the family tree. Um, Ishmael and the brothers made up, huh? Hagar and Ishmael were not kicked out or whatever. This guy's just making things up here. That does not surprise me for some reason. Don't get the idea that a loving God does not punish people who break his word. God says, when I see you invade this covenant land, now the fight is with me because I am the defender of Israel. And he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. You're going to lead these five vicious anti-Semitic armies to crush the chosen people. And Dude, I don't know what verses he's even using to arrive at this conclusion. Five armies to crush God's people? What does all that mean? Where did he get all of that? You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, to their credit at least, give us some glimpse into what the hell they're talking about, like what verses they're using to arrive at their conclusions. At least they give us the verses they use, and we can cobble together some kind of nonsensical, you know, kind of uh, logical train that they use to arrive there. Even if it's complete garbage, we can understand the rough idea. Like Joseph Rutherford, second president of the Jehovah's Witness organization, came to the conclusion that the end would come in 1925. Do you want to know how he came to that conclusion? Jews have something called Jubilee years, right? So the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath. You're supposed to respect the Sabbath, not do anything on that day, not light a fire. You can't, like, people light their ovens the day before on a low temperature and keep it lit all day so they can just put their pre-prepared food in and, and heat it up and eat it, for example, um, because they can't light a fire that day. They can't turn light switches on, so they have automatic light switches that'll do it for them. Um, they cannot ask somebody who is not Jewish to sin on their behalf, like asking them to turn the air conditioner up or down or turn the light on for them. They can suggest it. Boy, it'd be nice if it was a little brighter in here. They can't say, will you please turn the light on? You know, they take this shit seriously. Every hospital in on Manhattan, I think maybe in New York City, but at the very least on Manhattan Island, every hospital, stops at every single floor every elevator stops at every floor so that a jewish person doesn't have to hit the elevator button which would be breaking the sabbath right the point is that the sabbath is highly respected by the jewish community the number seven is highly respected by by jews so the seventh day of the week the seventh year is a special year also. That's when indentured servants are freed from their contracts. Some debts are forgiven. Um, you know, d certain circumstances, people's debts and, and things are just forgiven on the seventh year. And when you get seven multiplied by seven, 49, 
the next year after that is called a jubilee year it's a special year and you're supposed to pray to god and thank him for blah 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 on the seventh day of the seventh month of the 50th year you're supposed to blow a trumpet or some other thing like that that's what a jubilee year is it's every 50 years is a jubilee and uh joseph rutherford believed that he'd calculated out that the end of the jubilee years added up to 1925 and that's when the end would be here and on top of that, here's another one. Jehovah's Witnesses in 1975 thought that it had been 6,000 years since creation, and that meant that God was going to rest on the 7,000th year. Like, it's just nonsensical garbage after nonsensical garbage with these people. It's nuts! Coopmaster, yes, it's called the Yahubi. No, I'm sorry, no. It's called the... Wait. It's called the Yubo. The 50th is called the she Shemitah. The Shemitah. Interesting. Knowing is half the battle, as my friend G.I. Joe says. That is a really interesting uh, little fun fact there. Anyway, should give you some insight into, um, you know, the book of Daniel, the prophecies that these people love to butcher, and um, why they're completely wrong about all of it. But anyway, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call it here for now. I'm going to cover more of this on my unfiltered YouTube channel. Uh, I do this kind of thing every Wednesday and Thursday morning, uh, 10.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. If you guys want to come over there with me Wednesday and Thursday morning, see some of this stuff, it's pretty interesting if I do say so myself. Not to toot my own horn or anything like that. Toot toot, baby, toot toot. So, yeah, come on over and take a look. I think it's pretty good. But, yeah, thanks for coming. Sabbath seems more stressful than restful. Thanks, God. Yeah, thank you, Sarah Wilson, for that, that message. Uh, writing is forbidden in, on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to, to write. And that, that means no highlighting either. So if you have a book that you're reading on the Sabbath, which a lot of people like reading books, you know, they, it's enjoyable practice to read, you can't use a highlighter to highlight your stuff. You must use tabs because a highlighter would be considered writing. That's how far it goes sometimes. Anyway, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out. It's been fun. I hope to see you guys tomorrow morning, Wednesday and Thursday morning, 10.30 a.m. That would be awesome. And um, I'll see you guys next time, okay?